Well, good evening, Sister Hound Dog. Steve wishing you a happy, happy, happy New Year. Here we are on January the 1st, and uh, it's time to make a few predictions. Uh, now, I did go back over last year's predictions. I did 10 last year for 2019. Um, I'm only going to do five this year. Um, now, uh, I'll give you the top five from last year. Uh, number one was the Yellow Vest protests. Number two was the debt reset. Uh, three was climate change. Four was scientific breakthroughs, and five was a hard Brexit. And uh, now, the top five for this year, and I'm going to talk about all of these individually, uh, but the top five of this year are very, very close. Uh, the protests around the world, uh, the Yellow Vest protests have now morphed. Um, climate change. Climate change is going to be a game changer in 2020. Uh, the Brexit the whole situation there with the election of the Conservative government, again, is an absolute game changer for the EU. And of course, what is going to uh, probably not be the most important story, but it's certainly going to dominate the news, and that is the US election in 2020, in November. And uh, that is going to lead to, I think, an incredible year ahead. So basically, uh, the predictions that I have for this year are pretty much the same. That the, the one thing that I would take off the table is the debt situation. Um, I don't think we're going to have anything like a reset this year, uh, purely and simply because Donald Trump is going to do absolutely everything within his power to keep the U.S. economy just steaming along. And whether we like it or not, uh, the U.S. economy is the dominant economy and the dollar is the dominant currency and so we tend to follow uh, what's going on in the US uh, is going on in the rest of the world so this year uh, I think you're going to see uh, possibly even increases in the stock market um, I don't think uh, if it doesn't increase it's not going to go down very much uh, there may be a few shock situations just because of the algorithms which are now trading uh, but other than that uh, no, I think you're going to see that uh, the economy is going to steam pretty stable for at least another year. So 2019 definitely was the year of the protest, and those protests have now expanded to uh, being a worldwide phenomena, and they're all pretty much about the same thing. Uh, so uh, here, just pop up this article that I found, and I just read this short piece, which kind of sums it all up. Protests rage around the world. But what comes next? And what comes next indeed? Few corners of the world have been spared significant protests in 2019. Russia, Serbia, Ukraine and Albania have all seen major demonstrations. So has the UK against Brexit, France with its Yellow Vest movement and Spain in the rest of the region of Catalonia. The Middle East has convulsed with so much dissent that some are calling it a second wave of the Arab Spring. In South America, Brazil, Peru, Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela have experienced popular unrest. The list goes on and you can now add Iran to that list. The traditional system of enforcing power from top to bottom is increasingly being challenged, says Thierry de Montbrial of the French Institute of International Relations. There is a social revolution with a growing demand for participatory democracy. It is also easier in a digital, globalised world to know how the other half or the 1% live. There are not just new streams of information, but streams of people, says Van Stekelenburg. Those youngsters in the Arab Spring in all likelihood knew at least one person living overseas, and it creates a kind of relative deprivation. I want to have that too. The proliferation of protests is no guarantee that things will change. Staging demonstrations is no longer the difficult part, says Yusuf Sharif, a political analyst and one of the authors of new Carnegie Endowment research on the success of protest movements. The problem is what to do after the protests. How do you make your point and achieve the goals you're protesting for? That proves to be the most difficult part. Protests and revolutions are defined by idealised slogans, he says, but systematic change is harder work. You can break off part of a system, but it's very hard to break the whole structure, which is formed of institutions and networks that are very difficult to break. The leadless nature of many of the protests makes them harder for authoritarian governments to quash, but it may also make the movements more difficult to sustain, says Sanjoy Chakravorty, a professor of global studies at Temple University. 
the movements that actually led to change or that were more sustained. They had a basis, a leadership structure, people articulating, organization, going door to door to get people to show up to a rally, he says. The leadership question is central, and that is the thing we haven't figured out yet. How do we actually find leadership in these inchoate displays of anger? So as you can see, the uh, inequality, the inequality of incomes, um, the food prices, the cost of living, um, the lack of democracy, uh, people are now feeling uh, that they need to be able to participate in that democracy. And of course we've seen through issues like Brexit uh, that um, there really isn't much democracy being played out at all, uh, in, certainly in the EU. And uh, people are starting to notice. And because we have the internet, uh, we can now share these ideas and thoughts very, very quickly. And this, of course, is going to lead to a sub-prediction, uh, which is the battle for the Internet. And the, that is going to take place, I believe, this year. Uh, India has blacked out the Internet some 20 times. Um, Iran is uh, blacking out the Internet. Russia is doing a test blackout of the Internet. And I believe Germany also is doing a test blackout of the Internet because of the uh, ruling elites, the globalists, are scared to death that we can communicate with each other and that we are not as dumb as they took us for and that we're seeing uh, the plan unfold and that uh, sadly, well, the only part that we play in this plan is a minor role. And uh, so I think uh, you're going to see, as I say, these protests are going to increase and I think they're going to become more and more widespread. And they will all be about uh, similar things now, which uh, brings me on to my next prediction, uh, which is climate change. Uh, we've had a devastating year from climate change. Uh, we went from a mud and uh, late rains and snows and frosts in the springtime. This was probably the latest planting has ever happened in the US. Uh, we had rain all through the year in the Midwest and yet we had drought up here in Canada. Uh, we had very little rain certainly in eastern Canada and yet western and central Canada again had lots of rain. Uh, western Canada had unusually cool temperatures and so the weather is just all over the map. And then in the fall again we got into early snows uh, we got into heavy rains, there was floods, there was um, farms were destroyed, storage was destroyed and in the early fall we had snow, a rain, uh, there were crops that couldn't be gone off the fields and uh, approximately 60% of the canola crop in Canada uh, is still on the field. And so this has made it a very difficult year and of course this has affected Europe where uh, Central and Northern Europe have had a wet season and of course in southern Europe they've had an extremely dry year with crops failing from lack of moisture. Uh, Britain again has had floods in its main growing areas and there have been several crops not the least of which is the potato crop has uh, basically failed. Uh, beets are another crop that has failed they've rotted in the fields because of the damp weather. Uh, India's onion crop has failed. Uh, there is so much upheaval in our food production systems and of course uh, this is going to cause increases in prices throughout the world. Uh, corn and soya crops have failed and that means the fattening up of livestock will take a lot more money. Uh, it will cost more to plant grains. Uh, it will cost more for fertilizers and uh, pesticides and herbicides. Uh, so there are lots of things going against the farmer and fruit production worldwide and a significant increase in cost is coming in the year 2020 and uh, that is going to put an awful lot of pressure on people and that as they say will in turn feed the protests that are already uh, springing up all over the world. Now Brexit, uh, the uh, my third prediction for 2020 is going to be a major issue. Uh, the Conservative Party have had a landslide win in England. Uh, the Labour Party have been absolutely decimated. Jeremy Corbyn is about to step down. Uh, they have no clear idea of who they're going to put up there as a leader. And the party is in complete disarray. It may take a decade, a decade, for the Labour Party to rebuild the kind of trust that it needs to do with its um, grassroots members, the working class people of England. Uh, they have completely abandoned the working class and it's incredible that the Conservative Party are now the representatives of the working class 
and that they're the ones who are going to push through sovereignty, independence and Brexit. Now, I still believe, although I was off with the um, hard Brexit in March of uh, 2019, but I believe that there will be a hard Brexit in 2020. Uh, like I say, Boris Johnson has got a very strong mandate and I think that the Europeans, the EU, are going to irritate the situation and Boris is going to lose his patience and he's going to say, that's it, we're out, we're done, we're not going to get a deal, we're not going to do a deal, you're not going to allow a deal. And uh, so we are going to leave and that will be that. And when that happens, well, even the fact that some kind of Brexit is going to take place uh, is going to give ammunition to the European countries that are uh, unhappy right now, which would be Italy, Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, maybe not the French government, but certainly the French people are very dissatisfied with their situation. And uh, I think that's probably the one country that's had the most protests from different sides. You have unionists, uh, you have yellow vests, and you have socialists all protesting against the Macron government. Now, my number four prediction uh, is the election in the US this year, 2020, Donald Trump. Uh, we don't even know who he's going to face. Um, it's looking like Joe Biden. Uh, now let's just flip over to um, a prediction chart and uh, what the betting is on the candidates. Uh, now here is a site called Predict It and uh, this is the uh, who will win the 2020 Democratic presidential nomination. Uh, number one, of course, Joe Biden, and he is actually way ahead. Uh, Bernie Sanders, 25 cents. Uh, Joe Biden, 39 cents. Pete Buttigieg, 13 cents. Uh, just ahead of Elizabeth Warren, 12 cents. Now they're they're quite a way back. I mean, that's that's a 15, a 50 percent, sorry, uh, back from uh, the two top contenders. Uh, after that is Michael Bloomberg at nine. Andrew Yang, eight. Amy Klobuchar, uh, six, and Hillary Clinton, right down at the bottom, five cents. So, uh, well, we'll have to see. We'll have to see how this plays out. So, as you can see, Joe Biden is in the lead, uh, Bernie Sanders second, and Elizabeth Warren is third. And I find it interesting that Biden being the favorite, if he does win the nomination, uh, it will be two old white guys duking it out to uh, lead the country and of course this will be a bit of pill I'm sure for the radical Democrats uh, because they have been very anti-white establishment males and now they're going to be forced to hold their nose and vote for Joe Biden or Bernie Sanders which is another uh, older patriarch uh, and uh, vote if they want to get rid of Donald Trump but I don't think that any of these three top candidates uh, can match Donald Trump on a stage. Uh, there is no doubt about it, this man is a performer. And the way the Democrats have basically um, gone after Donald Trump, I, th I think they have really, I don't know, they, they, they have lowered the standard a lot. And it really is, as we can all see, I think, I certainly can see, that this has become a witch hunt for Donald Trump. And so the media the mainstream media, who are all basically, apart from Fox, uh, is um, a democratic-leaning or left-leaning media outlet, uh, I think you're going to see them do the most incredible things. They are going to turn themselves inside out to try and make sure that Donald Trump does not win the 2020 election. And my prediction is he's going to romp. The more they turn against Donald Trump, the stronger he seems to become. Uh, even Democrats, you know, there was uh, three Democrats went over to the other side and voted against the impeachment. And so it was a bipartisan vote, even though it was slim, it was a bipartisan vote against the impeachment. And even though it lost, uh, it will, of course, get um, voted down as it goes through the Senate. And uh, Donald Trump will be on the 2020 ballot. Uh, I don't think you'll see any other Republican challenges uh, because he has an extremely strong position and uh, I have seen some of his rallies uh, and he has people captivated. He has a way of being able to relate to the public uh, that the Democrats seem to have lost and I think they're going to suffer the same kind of defeat that uh, Labour did. Labour had become tone deaf 
to their core supporters. And uh, Democrats have done the same thing. They have become the party of the elites. And people are starting to recognize that. And, you know, I will guarantee you that 80% of the population are middle of the road. And if you just say, for example, split that down the center and say 40% are Republican and 40% are Democrat, that middle 80%, those Republicans and Democrats, have more in common with each other than they have in differences with each other. Okay, And what they want to see is common sense decisions made on behalf of the country in which they reside so that they can survive, that they can pay their bills, that they can pay off their homes and look forward to some kind of uh, half-decent retirement and watch their kids grow up, get married, have children and uh, earn a living and have some hope of a decent future for them too. And all of the democratic policies right now have been to get Trump and they haven't really addressed the issues of the working class people, uh, the cost of living. Uh, in fact, they have made it pretty clear that they intend to make the cost of living more expensive. And I find it kind of ironical that Bernie Sanders, although he seems to be all for equality, was actually caught uh, not paying his staff uh, minimum wage and he had to relent and up the wage but then what he did was he laid off a whole bunch and cut the hours of the rest to cover the increase in costs. So here you have somebody who is professing to be on your side, but when the chips are down, that doesn't live up to his own standards. And I really do think the public are starting to recognize this kind of stuff. And that's why you're seeing such a radical swing uh, in voter preferences. So the fifth prediction and I think this is going to go along with all the rest it's going to be tied in with the election and that is the battle for the internet uh, we have yet to really see what the uh, new terms of use uh, rules are and how they're going to affect channels on YouTube uh, the new rules on Twitter and also the COPPA the Children's Online Privacy and Protection Act uh, that comes into effect as of January the 1st this year and so we don't really know exactly how that is going to play out uh, but wherever you look around the world uh, governments are trying to silence the independent voices on the internet um, Germany, Europe have all got um, awful, awful draconian rules and regulations now about what you can put up on YouTube, what you can say, what you can't say. Now, all of these countries want the option of being able to shut down the internet. India has done it, as I said, some 20 times already uh, in this year because of all the protests that have taken place over there. But Russia was going to have a test shutdown. Uh, Iran has shut down the internet several times. And so we're starting to see China, of course, has complete control of the internet and what it's uh, population C and I think you're going to see that um, you know governments are going to want to push this agenda uh, further and further forward and it is something that we should all rally around no matter what your political stripe uh, or whether you're non-political uh, any kind of suppression of freedom of speech for any reason is unwarranted and dangerous even if you don't like the speech that other people are using uh, it, is, it is very, very dangerous to shut down freedom of speech because at the end of the day, uh, if you have an angry Democrat, um, liberal, Labour individual, supporter, and an angry conservative Republican supporter, and they're shouting and screaming at each other, uh, one might be red, one might be blue, but they'll be using exactly the same words so as far as the algorithm is concerned on the internet uh, they will be indistinguishable from each other and so uh, you're going to see all kinds of things being knocked out so the people for example who might be against uh, GMOs and Monsanto all of a sudden they're going to be shut down because it will be considered bullying or hate speech or um, it will be considered uh, misinformative or conspiracy or something like that and uh, there you go then you no, no one is going to get their word out neither the left nor the right 
nor the centre. Nobody will get the true word out and these big corporations and governments will control the whole thing because we can see quite clearly now that government and social media platforms are absolutely well and truly in bed with each other and uh, they will continue to want to control the internet and exclude freedom of expression. Um, this is probably the most scary thing to this cabal of globalists that want to have absolutely every waking thought monitored in case it poses some kind of threat to them. Now that, my friends, is what you call absolute paranoia. And every country is exhibiting the same kind of paranoia that we saw in some of these despotic leaders uh, like uh, Stalin, Pol Pot, uh, Idi Amin, um, Hitler, you name it, Saddam Hussein, they all had this incredible paranoia that everybody was plotting against them. And this should give you some kind of idea as to who we're dealing with here. Why would you be paranoid if you're doing things that are acting only in the best interests of the public and the majority of the public at that? And I think we will all recognize when that is taking place uh, and you have to hide it. You have to hide what you're doing. There is something very seriously wrong with that because all governments and all corporations, corporate citizens, should all be doing their absolute very best, not just for themselves, but for the planet and every citizen on it. And that clearly is not happening. We can see that. And so the fear of the internet and the truth that is being spread on the internet is visceral to these globalists because it completely contradicts their narrative and they cannot allow anybody to contradict the narrative because they truly believe that if you erase the word, you erase the th And of course anybody uh, who has an IQ above room temperature knows that you have not erased the thought. In fact, you have strengthened the thought by removing the word. So I think we're in for a fascinating 2020. Um, those predictions may not be very exciting, but I think they are going to be a continuation of what we saw in 2019. I think the PC culture is going to wane in 2020 because it has actually gone past the bounds of uh, good intent into the ridiculous. Uh, and I did notice this year that the uh, Baby is Cold Outside song was being played on just about every radio station uh, without any question at all. And there was a real focus on calling Christmas Christmas, uh, not uh, happy seasons and happy holidays and all this kind of nonsense. Uh, you know, we all have our own celebrations and Christmas is a Christian celebration and uh, we enjoy it. And I think that others should respect that as we respect their individual celebrations throughout the course of the year. And this is how true tolerance is built, uh, not by vilifying any particular belief system, but by uh, allowing whoever wants to uh, follow a particular ide ideology as long as it doesn't impinge on someone else's ideology. So whatever you want to uh, believe, whatever ideology you want to follow uh, within the uh, walls and confines of your own home is just great. So when we go out on the street, if we want to see equality, then we have to treat all people equally. That's the only way. You, you, you can't treat a certain group of people unequally and call yourself um, an egalitarian society. And that, I assume, is what we're all moving towards, where we can all cooperatively get along, do our own thing uh, without interference from someone else, as long as our, what our thing is is not affecting somebody else in a bad way or a negative way or somebody's getting hurt. And, uh, yeah, the only way to do that, the only way to do that, to find equality, is to treat everybody around you with the same kind of equality that you want to see. Anyway, I'm hoping that that's going to come to fruition. And in the meantime, we will be following these and many more stories during the course of 2020. So please, I hope you'll join me. I'd like to thank you all again for coming through this journey of 2019 with me and uh, some of the stories that we've followed. It's been great to get to know some of you. Um, I'm still in contact with quite a few people uh, through uh, email, and uh, that is just great. Okie dokie, well, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe below. And in the meantime, this is Hamburg Steve wishing you a very, very 
happy, safe and prosperous new year. So you take it easy, take care and we'll talk to you very, very shortly. See you now. Bye.